Welcome to part nine of Presidents, Plutocrats, Paupers, and Populists. Now we're going to take a look at the rise of labor unions. Now, like I said, conditions that these people worked in were often very dangerous, and there's very little protections and very little repercussions for when disasters happen. So I'm going to give a couple quick examples, each one on either side of the Gilded Age, so you can kind of see how little things changed over time. The first one is an incident that happened on September 6, 1869 at the Avondale Mine. The Avondale Mine is in Plymouth, Pennsylvania, or outside of Plymouth, Pennsylvania, and it's owned by the Steuben Coal Company. Now, the thing about coal mining, it's very dangerous, right? You got, aside from the dangers from inhaling the coal dust, but you also have the fact that this coal dust is very flammable. And when the coal comes out of the ground, you have that coal mixed in with the rock, and it goes through a thing called a coal breaker. The coal breaker are two counter-rotating rotating steel drums. It crushes the, uh, the rock, and it, it allows you to separate the worthless rock from the valuable coal. Now, here's the thing. Because of the coal dust that coal breaker creates, you really wanted to have it as far away from the entrance of the mine as possible, because there's a lot of potential for fire. You got sparks and everything else, right? But for every foot that you move that worthless rock that requires energy, that's less efficiency, right? So the closer that coal breaker is to the entrance of the mine, the more efficient the mine is. Now, if you look at this picture here, you can see that building there is the coal breaking house. And that smaller structure in the upper left-hand corner, that's the mine entrance. They are literally butted up against each other. So on September 6, 1869, a fire broke out in the coal breaker. And when the fire filled that dark, thick, black smoke into the room, those windows you see there, there wasn't enough for that smoke to get out. That smoke just went straight down the mine shaft. And in the process, then, it killed 110 workers, right, including two rescue workers and also a 12-year-old boy, year boy who was working his first day on the job. His father had brought him to work in the coal mine for the first time, right? Now... This is 1869. What was the result of this fire and the death of 110 workers? Well, nothing. The company was not held accountable for the disaster, and the families did not receive any kind of compensation for the loss of their loved ones. So what was it like on the other side of the Gilded Age? The example I have on the other side of the Gilded Age took place in New York City on March 25th, 1911, right? Um, the 10-story tall ash building was the house of the Triangle Waste Company, right? The top three floors, the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors housed this shirt waist factory. A shirt waist is one of those, if you see those uh, late 1800s, early 1900 blouses that women wore that had the blooming shoulders and sleeves and all that, that's a shirt waist, okay? So, on 440, at 4.40 p.m. on March 25th, 1911, on the eighth floor of the Ash Building, a fire broke out at the shirt waste factory, right? And remember, this is, you know, a lot of clippings, cotton fiber. This cotton fiber isn't treated with fire retardants like the clothes we wear now are. And that fire very quickly just blew, blossomed out of control, right? Now, the building itself is 10 stories tall, right? And it's only got four elevators, but only one worked. There's an internal stairwell, and then there was a fire escape, but the fire escape was so flimsy that when the first group of women began to utilize it, it quickly collapsed. You can see a picture of it there, right? So you had 600 workers on these three floors. 500 of them were girls between the ages of 16 and 23, and most of them were Eastern European. Okay, the fire that started on the eighth floor quickly raged out of control and burned itself out in 30 minutes. But in that time, it ravaged all three floors. Most of the girls on the eighth floor managed to escape, right? They managed to get to the stairwell. Most of the girls on the 10th floor escaped because they, like the one of the owners, Max Blank, who was also on the 10th floor at the time, managed to hop to an adjoining building. But the women on the ninth floor especially were trapped. And 146 of these workers were killed. Uh, 58 of them jumped rather than be burned alive, right? And literally came plummeting down to the ground there um, around the factory, right? Now, the fire department had already declared this building unsafe due to inadequate escape routes, right? 
back in 1902. This was building was known to be dangerous. And here it is nine years later, you have this major fire. So are there any repercussions? Well, owners Max Blank and Isaac Harris were both indicted for manslaughter, but they both got acquitted. And again, what happens here? Well, the women were not compensated. The families were not compensated. The owners didn't, were not held accountable, right? Matter of fact, the only thing that happened is that there was so many women killed, they didn't have enough coffins in the city. So instead, in the Eastern European portions of New York City, they put an ad in saying, hey, come on down to uh, the corner of uh, Green Street and Washington Place tomorrow. We're getting out free sandwiches and beer. And when these Eastern Europeans showed, here's all these dead girls lined up and said, oh, by the way, whichever one of these are your relatives, take them with you. That was how they got rid of some of the bodies. So with conditions of these like these, it's no wonder that you eventually have the rise of labor unions. I mean, think about it. You've got the government's taking a laissez-faire stance on these things. They're not wanting to get involved. You've got the industrialists who, for the most part, some of them are more concerned with the laborers than others, but for the most part, they're concerned about profit, right? Something has to fill that void. And so labor unions tried to do that. The, one of the earliest labor unions was formed in 1869. They called themselves the Knights of Labor, and they were formed by Terence V. Powderly, right? Uh, it was created to organize all laboring pe people under one national labor union, right? It offered membership, as Terence Powderly put it, to the producing masses, and all workers of all classes and all skill level were welcome except those he labeled social parasites. Who are the social parasites? Well, according to Powderly, it was lawyers, bankers, and liquor salesmen, right? Anybody else could apply. Uh, since it represented equal opportunity and equal pay, it also attracted minorities and even women. At its peak in 1886, the Knights of Labor had reached a membership of about 700,000 Americans, okay? Uh, it's advocated an eight-hour workday, the end of monopoly, uh, the end of monopolies, the end of child labor through increased wages so that you didn't have that dependency anymore where you had to, your children had to work, a graduated income tax, right, and the promotion of education and cooperative uh, uh, institutions, okay? Now, its representation of unskilled laborers actually weakened it uh, as a labor union because if your unskilled laborers went on strike, so what? If I'm a factory owner, and all my floor sweepers go on strike, I'm just gonna fire them all and hire a bunch of new people that can work a broom. How many people can't work a broom, right? But the beginning of the end for the Knights of Labor actually occurred at the same time it was hitting its peak membership there in 1886. What had happened was that on May 1st, 1886, there had been a uh, strike going on in front of the McCormick Reaper Works in Chicago, in which the police had uh, broken the uh, strike up and it killed a couple of the workers. So three days later on May 4th a group of 1886, a group of socialists and anarchists had met at Chicago's Haymarket Square to protest the death of the strikers, right? Several people were there to speak that day, including a man named Samuel Fielden. Samuel Fielden spoke later in the day when the number of people were beginning to dwindle, but he gave a particularly inflammatory speech calling for the socialist and the working class to rise up against the laws which he uh, described as the enemy of the working men. And at this point, the police decided, all right, it's time to move in. Up to this point, they had been just kind of watching it and letting it go. They wanted it to remain peaceful. But after Samuel Fielden's speech, they decided, all right, it's time to break this party up. So they moved in to begin to break up this party, and right about that time, somebody, we don't know who, threw a bomb. When it was over, seven policemen had been killed by the bomb, police had opened fire on the crowd, and several people had been killed and many others had been uh, wounded. Um, there's really, like I said, no evidence on who tossed the bomb, but the police focused on the radical members who had formed and organized the protest. Eight men were arrested, including Samuel Fielding. All eight of them were convicted, seven of them were sentenced to death, and four of the uh, seven were executed on November 11th, 1887. Now, it just so happened that one of the condemned belonged to the Knights of Labor Union. That was the very tedious link between the Knights of Labor and what became known as the Haymarket Riot, right? Um, now, 
the Knights of Labor denounced and disavowed any connection to this incident on Chicago's Haymarket Square, but the press and politicians uh, tried to uh, deliberately link the Knights of Labor to the incident, and it really just, the, the propaganda caused membership to the Knights of Labor to plummet, and eventually the Knights of Labor uh, Union uh, dissolved and disappeared altogether. Other labor unions were a little bit more successful. For example, the American Federation of Labor, which was formed by Samuel Gompers in December of 1886, is still around today. It's part of what is now called the AFL-CIO, the largest labor union in the United States. Uh, the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, was a loose combination of trade unions, right? So these were skilled workers that he represented. Matter of fact, Samuel Gompers was very particular over who he allowed into under the umbrella of the American Federation of Labor. Had to be skilled trades unions, and it had to be certain ones too. Now he did have certain things that he uh, uh, mandated for the AFL. First of all, he said that the AFL should not become politically active. Maybe that's something the AFL-CIO should think about today. It did not endorse political parties. It only endorsed candidates who supported their issues. By 1900, its membership had grown to over 500,000 uh, members, and by 1920, its membership had reached 4 million. But like I said, Gompers was pretty particular over who he let in. For example, in 1903, the Japanese Mexican Labor Association, a California union that represented beet thinners, which is uh, kind of a strange occupation, I'll let you Google that, um, applied for membership into the AFL. Now, the uh, Samuel Gomper said that he would allow the uh, Japanese Mexican Labor uh, uh, Association into the AFL, but only if they kicked out their Chinese and Japanese workers. He says, we are not going to represent Asians in our labor union. Needless to say, the Japanese Mexican Labor Association said, um, dude, that's kind of like the first word of our name. And because of this, because of the refusal to kick the Japanese and Chinese members of their union out, they were denied membership in the AFL. Another union here was the American Railway Union. This was formed by a man named Eugene V. Debs. Now, I'm going to say right now, anytime we talk about Eugene Debs in this uh, uh, survey class, at least, it, it means we're talking about somebody who's about to go to jail, right? He's going to go to jail a lot. Matter of fact, at one, at one point in prison, he's going to convert to socialism and run as a presidential candidate as a member of the Socialist Party, and he'll run for president several times. But in 1893, he founded the American Railway uh, Union, which was uh, uh, born out of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen, right? Uh, the American Railway Union represented the people who coupled and decoupled rail cars. So they weren't directly connected to the Pullman Palace Car Company, who manufactured luxury railroad cars. But they decided, Eugene Debs decided to become involved when the Pullman Company, led by George Pullman in May of 1894, decided to cut wages at the Pullman Palace Car Company by 28%. He cut wages, but he didn't cut the cost in the company store or for the company housing where the workers lived. And so these workers went on strike as a result. The American well Railway Union decided to support the Pullman strikers by refusing to couple or decouple any Pullman cars in, on any of the rail lines. Now this had a pretty profound effect. What happened as a result of this is that railroad traffic in Chicago came to an immediate standstill and nationwide railway traffic was reduced by about 70 to 80 percent, right? Um, pretty significant. However, George Pullman was a pretty savvy guy and what he did was he pointed out to uh, uh, he contacted the uh, federal government, the, uh, the president, and said, look, these guys by doing this are actually interfering with the delivery of U.S. mail, right? Because now these mail rail cars, these, these cars with U.S. mail on it, are also not getting coupled or decoupled because of the traffic tie up because of the Pullman strike. And that is a federal offense. And so Grover Cleveland, the president at the time, is going to uh, break the strike. He's going to send in troops to break the Pullman strike 
uh, Eugene Debs is going to be arrested. He's going to be charged with violating the Sherman Antitrust Act, and the American Railway Union is going to be dismantled using the Sherman Antitrust Act, right? Now, that's not to say that the federal government didn't, didn't always pass laws or do things against labor. Matter of fact, they'll even um, uh, establish a holiday for the laboring masses called Labor Day. But they were very careful about when they established this holiday. You'll notice that Labor Day is always in September, and there's a reason for that. See, for socialists, the day to celebrate labor is May 1st, May Day. And so in order to create a holiday for the laboring works, but to disassociate it with the ideas of socialism, they made Labor Day in September, putting it about as far away as they can imagine from the socialist labor holiday of May Day.